Hi, hello, and welcome, or welcome back, I suppose. VoiceOver Autumn here with another short video. This was originally meant to be a longer Thursday video. If I have one short, one long video, I usually go short Tuesday, long Thursday. I don't know why. Anyway, while doing my reading for the other planned video for this week, I realised it was going to be lengthy as of writing the script for this video I'm I was still trying to figure out how I was putting that video together I managed to come up with something as you will see on Thursday but let's get right on into it into the head fuck surrealism that is Besuas Untold Night and Day by the way, this is translated by Deborah Smith. I think the right place to start is by saying that this book requires a lot of focus. I kind of wish I was able to get an audiobook of this because I often find that reading and listening to audiobooks that I'm struggling to focus on really helps me, but that just wasn't a possibility here. It's not available on BorrowBox or Audible and generally I find that if it's not available on Audible it's unlikely to be found. That could just be that it's not translated. There could be a there could be an audiobook in the original Korean but there certainly isn't one in English. But even though that wasn't a possibility it is what it is. I managed to get through the book and it was fine. So I managed to get through the book. I still enjoyed it. So while, you know, focusing has never been my strong point, it was worth taking time over so I could pick up on all the little details. And I think part of not being able to focus was structural. So while it is a kind of confusing book to read, a big part of the issue in focus for me was that I wish there were more chapters to break things up. I've never been a fan of books with few chapters but their scene breaks. I know that sounds maybe a bit nitpicky but I know there are people who are going to be with me on that. It didn't change how much I enjoyed the book but it still is something that stuck out. I, it, there's loads of books that do that, the prefer scene breaks over chapter breaks and I understand it but it, it's never been my preference. Early on, so to get onto the actual meat of the book, early on there's this incredible description of the summer heat in Seoul. It's incredibly visceral and sets up that hazy dreamlike nature of the book incredibly well. It is setting up the heat as something that is antagonistic and I really enjoy that. While this book is confusing at times and has quite a dizzying quality to it, Basil has these like anchor points throughout to keep you knowing who slash what is being talked about and also to like keep you knowing where you are kind of thing there's just these phrases or motifs repeated throughout that almost keep you grounded so each character that's referenced the two in particular that i'm thinking of have these very set descriptions for them and whether that's them talking about themselves or somebody else seeing them if you see that description, you know, and it's always exactly the same. It's never like, oh, you see a bit of this. It is exactly the same description. And also throughout, there's these, um, oh, what are they called? Shipping forecasts or things will be written like shipping forecasts or plot points will, there'll be a shipping forecast and little plot points will fit throughout and yeah I just I think this might be the best way to explain it so 
I've already mentioned that this whole book feels like a weird dream the whole time. With that in mind, have any of you tried lucid dreaming? I never gave it a go myself, but I know enough people that have tried intentional lucid dreaming to have enough of an idea of how some of it works. And from what I can remember, when trying to lucid dream, people are encouraged in their you know, waking life to wear something like a, a watch, a bracelet or a ring every day, something uh, easily visible. So it usually is something on your hands or your wrists that you can check it. It's, like I say, something recognisable that keeps you grounded and aware. So in your daily life, it's something that you check every now and again. You know it's there. And that's something that you can, you know, you look at, for me, I look at my left hand, I can see my little ring on my right hand, I know there's a watch. And therefore, if I'm in a dream and I see that, I have that sense of awareness, I would then maybe know I'm in a dream, and you can go into lucid dreaming. That might not be the best way to explain it, but that's what I can remember. And for me, that grounding feeling that is offered by, you know, these, like like the watch or the bracelet or the ring, for lucid dreaming, the way they ground you, keep you aware... The repeated phrases and motifs throughout Untold Night and Day are, to me, this book's version of that, of the ring, the watch, the bracelet. They keep you aware of your surroundings and help you realise how things are tied together. So there will be, you know, those phrases mentioned elsewhere in the plot and it brings other things together. It's nice, like, um... You know, like in detective dramas and you see the pin board being brought together, it's a bit like that. Or, if you're like me, it's maybe a bit more like that bit in It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. <laughs> a show I haven't watched, but of course, yeah, it's a meme, so I know that bit, right? It just it helps keep things where you can track them, because it can be hard in this book to track things. I think the fact that there's... Is that a cat? Which cat? Hello Zelda. You finished? I'm sure she'll come up in a minute and scare the shit out of me. I think the fact that there is so much in only about 150 pages is incredible. If you can hear the wobbling of my blinds, it's because my cat is trying to get comfortable or she's about to jump on my bed because I'm filming upstairs. So I can get some peace and quiet, but apparently I'm not allowed that. She's uh, come to join us. Should we say hi? You want to say hi to everybody? See if I can remember to keep that in when I actually get there. Okay. It, nothing ever feels overstuffed or like you're not receiving enough information either. The book feels much bigger than it is. Not in a, oh god, this is dragging kind of way, but more like how I felt with people from my neighbourhood. It's just a case of getting a lot of bang for your book. I always find the ability to fit so much, quite frankly, in so little space, absolutely incredible. It is proof that someone really understands their craft. In my Six of the Best intro video, where I was talking about all the upcoming books, I think I mentioned Thomas Pynchon's The Crying of Lot 49 when I was talking about this saying that I thought the blurb made me think that the two books would be really similar. But at the very least, I thought they'd, you know, share a kind of vibe. And that they do. I was quite right about that. 
that dizzying, disorientating feeling is what really puts them in similar categories for me. There's just, they're not similar stories, but the feeling that you are left with while reading both of those books is what is the same for me. It's one of those things, you know, I think if you have read The Crying of Vault 49, no, The Crying of Vault 49, did I get that right this time? Yeah, if you've read that book and you did enjoy it, then I do think this will be up your street. Like I said, the stories themselves aren't similar, but there's something about each of them that strikes a similar part of my brain. Similarly, I read a book called Peach by Emma Glass. God, I think that was like 2018, 19 now, I think it was relatively new at the time, but like with Pynchon, it has this very disorientating and confusing quality that pinged something in my head that gave me that, oh yeah, this is, there's a shared quality here, and um, yeah, if you've read that, I don't know if her other book is the same, so I can't say if you've read Emma any Emma Grash like this, but if you've read Peach in particular, I do think this will be for you. So, slightly different outro this time, but you will probably get used to me talking about this now. So basically, currently I am at 25 subscribers. I'm a tiny, tiny little channel, and that's fine. I've not even been doing this a year yet, but basically, I'm trying to, I'm not trying to do big goals here, I'm trying to maybe double it, get to 50. I think, you know, if, even if I just start increasing subscribers, that'd be nice. My goal is 50, nothing major. But by the end of this year, 50 would be cool. If I get to 100, I think I'll cry. I know that sounds really small when I know that there are plenty of other YouTubers that people watch with thousands, millions, all that. But if I can get to 50, to 100, I'll be very happy. So I think the easiest way for you to help me with that is by retweeting the video tweet that I put out every time I put out a video. The link, if you didn't follow that to get here, which I think most people do, then if you didn't follow that link to get here, then just go into the description. Twitter will be in there. Go and retweet that. It would be a great help to me. Um, and I appreciate it. So, yeah. It feels very YouTuber-y to say that. And it feels a bit weird. But, you know, that has to be done. Um, do a little call to action. It's always fun. So... Let's wrap things up. I hope you have a wonderful day, a wonderful night, a wonderful whenever you are watching this. Take care of yourselves. Right.